My friends, welcome to another episode of Diner Talks with James. I'm James, and I'm pumped to be here with you all. Thanks so much for hanging out with me in the diner. I'm really excited about today's show, y'all. Let me tell you about our guest that we're bringing out right now. Writer, author, journalist, screenwriter, lecturer, African-American consumer, trends expert, social media fanatic, and a bunch of other adjectives that I can't say publicly. Lawrence Ross has been spent the last 20 years understanding the African-American consumer market. His journalistic work has appeared on CNN, and he's been interviewed by MSNBC, the BBC, NPR, the OPP, yeah, you know me, also the Los Angeles Times. Um, <laughs> he's the author of seven books. I got to talk to him about his free time. I don't understand what he's finding this time. Um, he's the author of the seven books, uh, most notably uh, Blackballed and the Divine Nine. Uh, he has a BA in American history from UCLA. Also receives his MFA from UCLA School of the, the, Theater. There it is. I clearly did not receive my MFA in theater, uh, film, and television. Ross is one of the most popular lecturers on the college circuit. Having lectured about college fraternities and sororities and the issues of a hazing at over a thousand schools, Ross is a man who I have respected for a number of years, and we have gone a little bit tighter from time to time. I've spent time at his incredible co-working space that he owns in Los Angeles as well. I can't wait for y'all to kick it with my man, Lawrence Ross, and myself. Lawrence, how you doing? Chilling, man. The only thing you forgot was legend. Legend. <laughs> oh, man. did I, I got to put that in my bio, and then once we get the legend, I think I'm, I'm fully complete. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I think that either shortens the bio, just like Lawrence Ross, legend. Welcome to the stage. And you know uh, something? That's actually my. I have two different things that I've been waiting to do all my whole life. So just be able to kind of walk on stage, just in a t-shirt, <laughs> and, <laughs> and no one trip, and and then just you know someone just say Lawrence Ross. I don't even have to say the rest of his stuff. That's mm -hmm. all I ask for. That's literally all I ask for. Because I, I just always remember when um, I was a college brother. And somebody would have, you know, a, a bio that went down to their sixth grade and won a spelling bee. And I'm like, I don't even care, man. Can you just get going with it? <laughs> so, but it, but you got to write, read it, uh, read it for folks who don't know anything about me. You got you got to do it. You got to do it. Uh, and actually, there's a couple things in there that I didn't know either. I did I did not know about the MFA from UCLA. That's awesome. Yeah. I'm a recovering UCLA field school grad. <laughs> You still, I noticed you haven't lost the Twitch yet. <laughs> oh, it's like, um, you know, the film, I, we could talk about, I could, th this might be a whole podcast in terms of, of film school. We'll talk about this, you know, my, my experience in film school was, was amazingly funny and weird at the exact same time. Yeah. I'd be happy to talk about that. <laughs> I'd be curious to hear a little bit of it. What made it, what made it funny and weird? So even how I even got there. I got to UCLA film school because I because of resentment and pettiness. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm already two, invested. <laughs> two two play two things. I'm I'm completely fine with. Mm -hmm. uh, I, it, the story actually begins at Thanksgiving. It's a weird little thing. Thanksgiving. Uh, my wife and I would invite anyone, particularly like in fraternity sororities who uh, you know was out in LA but couldn't go home, to come to our Thanksgiving. Right. Mm -hmm. And I had one of my fraternity brothers. Uh, Come. He had just graduated from NYU, right? Film school. Really good brother. He's still a good brother. He's got good produced stuff out there. So we had made the decision that we were going to, you know, write a project, you know, pitch some stuff. And um, it, my job was to write the story and he was to write the screen, you know, screenplay because I didn't know screenplay, you know, screenplay. And so we would get into arguments to the point that my wife was like, <laughs> in all these years, of, I've been married to my wife 30 years. We've never, ever had an argument like this, okay? And we just get in all these arguments. And to one point in time, he said, you know something? Why don't you write books? I'll write scripts. And I Ooh. said, oh, okay. <laughs> and so um, it was right around the time of the, the Great Recession, right before the housing market tanked. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I said, I told, uh, you know, asked my wife, I said, would you mind if, you know, if I, um, you know, went to UCLA for film school? And I said, you know, we'll sell the house because it's really at the top of the market, and then we'll move over to Westwood. She's like, yeah, fine. So we sold the house at the top of the market. Six months later, the housing market tanked. 
Um, but we had already got our money. And so we went to UCLA. And UCLA was weird because it was re really reflective of Hollywood at the time in particular. Hmm. There had 25 people enter their, uh, to the, the screenwriting program. Two were black, right? Then the next year, it's a two-year, three-year program. Depends on how you want to do it. The second year, they expanded it by 10 people. One person was black. And I was like, <laughs> y'all are doing this in reverse, okay? And it was, I, I, I really appreciate the, um, the, uh, the, the, the information I learned at UCLA and a nice little cherry, cherry wood degree that is on my wall. Um, but when it came to the structural issues at UCLA, oh, it was mind-blowingly familiar in terms of all the different things that you see. All the racism, there. Sexism, there. No. All right there in terms of, and weird people, all right there at UCLA. Couldn't yeah. you, you couldn't beat it. Had a woman, um, I'll tell you, her name, Terry Press. Who, <laughs> I'll say her name. She used to be the second in command of Jerry Katzen, uh, Katzenberg and then became president of CBS. She taught a class once for producers and, and writers where she, uh, and she, was, uh, she was a guest lecturer and she, she was um, doing publicity for a Queen Latifah film uh, called uh, Last Holiday. I don't know if you remember this, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, she, so there's all these MFA, pro, uh, MBAs there. They're going to be the people in, you know, like UTA, CAA, I, you, know, uh, you know, all the agencies and things like that. And they wear ties and everything. Screenwriters, they're dressed like I am now. So she goes out there and she says, um, black films don't translate internationally because black culture doesn't translate internationally. And so, and so they're all just writing it down. No. And I go, no. I go, um, can I ask a question? I said, what is that form of black culture that was formed in the South Bronx? Um, and she was like, and she started getting red. I said, called hip hop. She said, well, you know, that's different because music is universal, but film, no. I said, I raised my hand again. I said, do American comedies tend to translate internationally? And she was like, no, comedy is pretty specific to national, you know, sense of, senses of humor. I said, what percentage of black films at this time are comedies? And then she really got pissed. And she was like, 90%. So shouldn't we just say it's comedies, not in terms of black culture? So the guy who was actually um, the uh, uh, director, Lawrence Frank, uh, was coming out next. And he came out and he said, um, I want to talk about Last Holiday and us producing it, but I just want to talk, tell that young man right here, he's absolutely true and right in terms of what uh, he was saying. But all the all the things that people would you know believe when it came down to um, you know race and entertainment and business and all those things, all right there, concentrated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You it just was, got into this one beautiful microcosm. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> if you yeah. ever want to know why you know people in Hollywood make you know the Me Too movement, mm -hmm. UCLA, I could have told you the same thing years before the Me Too movement. Yeah. 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 I mean, things that people were just just letting go by and you'd sit back and go, wait a second, what's what's going on? And I, you know, me, I'm go, I call it out. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm not I'm not I'm not the person who's going to go. That's just awful. <laughs> you, know? Yeah. you know, I'm going to call it out. And, you know, that didn't make me that many friends. Right. Yeah. And the symbolism of this woman saying that and people putting their heads down and writing it down. Like, okay. Good to know. Good to know. Right. It was, like it was, she yeah. just, she said it and you watched as they took it as Canon. And this, these are the people who are going to then sit in front of me when I bring a pitch a project and they're going to see the limitations immediately. Yes. Immediately. Now that doesn't mean now you know, 15 years later, now that there are 11 billion streaming services that I'm not the star of the show. I'm the bell of the ball. I walk in because I've got all those projects 15 years ago that they were writing down. They were like, oh, these are limited, can really do. Oh, they want to know my projects now. Uh -huh. <laughs> they beat down my door to sit and ask me, what do I have? Which, of course, you know, I give no discounts. You know, you've seen my, uh, my motto, haven't you? Uh, repeat it for me. Uh, my motto is um, I write things for money and I don't believe in the racial uh, contributing to the racial wealth gap. So if you are going to pay full price. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes. so, 
So I am not grateful for just having the opportunity. <laughs> okay, mm -hmm. so a lot of these people, uh, you know, are uh, are being very being made very much aware of that as they as they look for my ideas. So yeah, that's the one thing I do uh, appreciate about UCLA. It gave it opened my eyes to what this whole business was. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. For better, I mean, I, yeah, for better or worse, for better and worse, and yeah, not or yeah. worse. <laughs> exactly. I'm yeah. going to be on the better side. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. I love that motto too. Uh, <clears throat> you know, Lawrence, so much of your work um, that I know of and, and that we've started to talk on a little bit here is around race yeah. um, <clears throat> and around culture, right. uh, particularly the black culture. Yeah. <clears throat> and, uh, I want I want to take it back. I want I want to take it back to a a young a young Lawrence. Um, oh, yeah. And uh, tell me what 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 was childhood like for you? Where where did you grow up? Where were you, where were you born and raised? Uh, and who who did a lot of uh, the raising of you? So uh, so I'm born and raised in Inglewood, California, uh, okay. which is right next door to L.A. Um, mom and dad, you know, sister, younger younger sister. Um, it's funny that you asked about the. Um, the younger child is uh, my mom delights in saying this. Um, she used to, which is absolutely true. When I was about eight years old, my mom used to introduce my sister and I to people as being, this is my daughter, Shauna. And this is my um, son, uh, Lawrence. He's my black child. <laughs> <laughs> he puts a fist up. <laughs> this is absolutely true. Yeah. So I was the kid who like did deep, deep, deep dives into uh, black history. Um, yeah, that was in particular um, black history um, at an early age. I mean, an early, early, early age. I remember my uh, grandparents went on a cruise, which was very extraordinary. Uh, you know, when back in the day, uh, you know, when I was a kid in the 70s and they came back with a book on Haiti and uh, Toussaint Levertour. And uh, and I was like, oh, I want to dress up like him for for uh, for <laughs> for, uh, for uh, <laughs> Halloween. And I think I was like nine or something like that. And <laughs> I had to keep telling like the nuns at my at my uh, elementary school that I was not George Washington. <laughs> no. like this. <laughs> so I have been like this my whole life. Um, one of the things, but it's not actually in particular my, you know, my parents weren't like this, you know, yeah, I wouldn't say, say that. I mean, my parents were, you know, kind of just ordinary, you know, parents. They didn't have any particular, uh, we, we were very, very deep into like family history type of deal. You know, my family, I'm the first born in California. Everybody else in my family is born in, in you know, before born in Texas. Okay. And so there's a very big, very huge Texas um, lineage, history, heritage that was really emphasized within our family. Um, but, you know, in terms of, you know, consciousness, black consciousness, nah, nah, I wouldn't say, you know, that, you know, it permeated in my family. My, my family, I always joke that my family, particularly my grandmother on my, uh, my, my paternal grandmother, uh, who um, worked at UCLA in the ombudsman office? Um, mm -hmm. um, we we were bougie aspirational, you know. <laughs> you know, we had one generation from coming from the cotton fields, right? So, yeah. you know, bougie aspirational is like you know a thousand count sheet on an air mattress. You know that. Yeah. That's <laughs> we, right? You know, we were the people. You know who? You know, my grandmother just had my whole life laid out for me, like at thirteen years old. Right. Mm -hmm. And to to my puzzlement, because <laughs> I didn't understand anything that she was saying. Uh, she said I was going to be I never forget this. She said I was 13. I was about to enter this Catholic school, uh, Loyola High School out here, all boys school. And she was like, um, what you're going to do is <laughs> you're going to um, you're going to go to UCLA. OK, I eventually went to UCLA. I went I started at Berkeley and I just finished up at uh, UCLA. Mm -hmm. Right. But she was kind of right on that. I was going to join the black ski club. Never been skiing in my whole life. Right? <laughs> um, she had a plan because my uncle's a Kappa that I was going to pledge Kappa. That did mm -hmm. not occur to mm -hmm. her. Um, she was uh, very stunned when I came my freshman year for Berkeley with an alpha uh, uh, T-shirt. And uh, she said, she just looked at me. And she, they had these big giant French doors. And she opened up the door and she was like, but your uncle's a Kappa. I was like, 
that's him. That's <laughs> you know, him. By the way, he was like, oh, it's all great. You know, he was yeah, like, yeah, right. Uncle, oh, it's all great, man. It's all great. It's love. Welcome to the fam. You know, that's <laughs> you know, my, my grandmother was like, oh, okay, I guess it's okay. So I could also yeah. not picture you as a Kappa. I know. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, nothing against Kappa. I was high. I mean, the, the, the funniest thing is uh, when I was 10, my, uh, my uncle and my aunt got married. Uh, my, my aunt's a Delta and my, my, my uncle's a Kappa and they got married and the reception was at the, uh, I was 10 years old. Mm-hmm. The reception was at the Kappa house out here in LA. And, um, and I asked, you know, I was like, why are they carrying sticks? And I always joke that black families don't tell kids anything, you know, so they were like, shut up. Boy. I was like, but can somebody explain this and everything like this? So it was it was funny because um, it, my this is what I always say that to 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 people interested in organizations, find the organization that is right for you. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, my one of my best friends in high school uh, uh, is a Kappa who went to Berkeley and everything. Um, so I have a bunch of friends and fam who are Kappas and everything, but for me, it was, no, it was, it was not, you know, yeah. what I, you know, I, I am probably the most alpha alpha on the face of this earth. You I, know? Th- I think I might agree with that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I mean, in terms of personality type, I am definitely, you know, yeah. I, I, I always joke with my, my Omega friends and say that no one stumbles into Omega sci-fi. You know, you, you, your personality type is Omega sci-fi, right? Yeah. Omega is like, this is what we are, right? Yeah, yeah, um, they make it pretty clear. They make it very clear. <laughs> Alpha, we kind of do the exact same thing, but on like the opposite way. Mm-hmm. We're not necessarily, you know, we're, we're, I was joking. We're the people who will enjoy a 12 hour discussion about Robert's Rules of Order. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We will enjoy that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we will, we will absolutely sit down, you know, and, and really, really, really intellectualize <laughs> deep talk Robert's rules of order. And, <laughs> and I always talk about it. It doesn't mean that we are, mm-hmm. but every alpha considers themselves to be a mini Martin Luther King. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, it's just, <laughs> we just wait for a movement to start or lead. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, mm-hmm. So, yeah. yeah. So, uh, but no, that was more of my personality. So, you know, and then I basically kind of, it's always been part of my DNA. Um, when I was in high school, I, I was talking about, I went to Loyola high school, which was at the time, they've gotten a lot better now, but at the time it was about 90% white. It was a, okay. the oldest Loyola high school is the oldest, probably most prestigious, I would say. Um, uh, it's the oldest in, educational institute in Southern California, beyond oh, way yeah. beyond UCLA, USC, and all the rest, right? And uh, it was a big deal um, for like you know black students in particular to black boys to get into Loyola High School. It still is. And um, we got there, and I always joke on our twenty fifth. I, I we had a large cohort of black boys that were there, and I always I joked on our twenty fifth, uh, and I said, you know, we were all smart Catholic kids. Do you also notice that we were all fast? <laughs> and, so, and, then one of, and one of my boys was actually a Kappa. One yeah. of my boys was like, he stopped eating. We were at Roscoe's Chicken and Waffles at the after party type of deal. Yeah. He was like, well, I'll be damned. <laughs> he had never thought of it or anything like that. <laughs> but um, we, like, when we got on campus, we started um, uh, protesting the fact they didn't have a Martin Luther King's birthday, you know. And for some of your younger viewers who think that Martin Luther King's birthday was always there, it wasn't. That's a federal holiday. And so, um, my mom only told me this 10 years ago at Thanksgiving. She said, you know, one of the Jesuits called me, right? And I said, no, I had no idea. She said, yeah, he called me. He said, um, we just wanted to let you know that Lawrence is doing a bunch of speeches. And by the way, uh, we're doing speeches on like Franz Fanon. You know, we're 14 years old. We don't know. We don't even understand this stuff, but we're reading it. We're yeah. like coming back and we're giving, you know, this is about the oppression of the colonialist society and the colonials. And this is what they're trying to do. And, you know, we, we, are, we, ha- we understand 50% of the words, right? right yeah. We do know the, the, just, the just of it. So she says, yeah, the, um, the priest, uh, the Jesuit, he, he said, he's, you're making these speeches at lunchtime. Now, my mom is paying tuition, right? So she's like, do you want him to stop? <laughs> because for the money I'm paying, <laughs> I can make that happen. Yeah. And to the Jesuit's credit, they were like, oh, no, 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 don't have him stop. We love his intellectual arguments. So they're right there. And we got, and we got our Martin Luther King's birthday uh, off. So, um, so from there is kind of like the natural progression to Berkeley where, you know, we protest Tuesday for not being Thursday and, uh, you know, and got, you know, 
it was like the most natural place for me to go. So that's always been part of my DNA, um, a consciousness, um, uh, you know, a, a consciousness about uh, about race, um, black people. And I would say that as I, you know, particularly when I got to college, an expansion uh, mm -hmm. of it, you know, the understanding beyond the silo of just, you know, knowing every M Malcolm X, you know, speech, you know, understanding the, the issues dealing with women, you know, um, uh, LGBTQ, disabled, you know, my, my, my goal is always to learn more, you yeah. know, to learn more and more and more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's first off, it's incredible that it started that young, uh, okay. <laughs> nine, nine years old, uh, <laughs> being a, a famous uh, uh, Haitian man uh, and being confused for George Washington because you had the same hat on. Uh, it's hysterical. Hey, uh, yeah. look, you know, it was like, hey, that I was my whole thing has always been y'all got to catch up to me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, speaking of helping people catch up real quick, you know, we were talking about Alpha, Kappa, Omega, uh, and, and whatnot, Delta. There are nine historically black fraternities and sororities uh, in the world. They make up what's a group called the Divine Nine, of which Lawrence has published uh, the most well-known book uh, on those as well. And so uh, so that's, uh, that's, that's just a little quick. For those of you that don't know about that fraternity world, there you go. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, and I'm, I'm a brother of IOTA Phi Theta Fraternity Incorporated, which is one of the, uh, which the newest member of that and uh yes i am white you're right um <laughs> and we can talk we, about that later. People, we, we have white members <laughs> they're historically like, black yes. yeah I was like, <laughs> people like, oh no we got all signs up we're like no 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 oh, yep. we, no we <laughs> had long-term white members it's yep. amazing <laughs> So I love how this carried you all the way through this passion of, of giving, you know, standing on the tables at lunchrooms. And, and let's be honest, if it was any other sect of Catholicism besides the Jesuits, you may have been told something different, but the Jesuits are by far the most liberal oh, uh, and the most education forward. God's Marines, man. Yep. God's Marines. <laughs> the, Jesuits, the Jesuits are responsible for, um, uh, for honing part of my philosophy and part of uh, the um, critical thinking. Mm. And it's, it, it's, in some ways, um, it, it, it's, uh, I have to tamp some things back because when people don't think the way uh, I was taught with Jesuits, I can kind of get short and I, that's kind of a fault. And I have to, you know, <laughs> I have to, you know, rein that back <laughs> because you have to recognize that not everyone thinks through problems or, um, you know, or even tax them in the exact same way. Um, you know, Jesuit's motto is see God in all things. Um, and as part of, you know, the seeing God in all things, it doesn't mean, by the way, I'm not saying that Jesuits are perfect in the Bible by far, but, you know, <laughs> no? but, no. <laughs> but, uh, but they are damn good at education yes. and they're damn good. And I can see a Jesuit educated uh, kid a mile away. I can a mile away. I can almost always find a Jesuit educated kid because they ask questions very different, very much different than Franciscans, you know, or public yeah. school, whatever. They ask very different questions. Um, and because we are really taught that our education is not simply for our own edification. It's for to do something out in the world. I always say, you know, Society of Jesus was the social justice warriors way before it became a, you know, little trendy uh, word, you know, you know, right. vilified by the right. Exactly. And what St. Ignatius, right? Go forth and set the world on fire. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I yeah, I, try, I think I try to live up to that. Yeah I, yeah, I think you're doing a great job. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. Some of your friends are hanging out with some fire extinguishers, but we good. Uh, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, There's a need for both. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. So, you know, it's fascinating that you had mentioned that your parents uh, – you know, obviously, you you never you didn't say that they were oblivious to to civil rights or being black oh. or anything like that. Or you know, they just weren't as emboldened as you were. And I'm curious. This is a question that I've asked a couple of my friends, uh, and I'm, I'm always intrigued to hear the answer. I think for you, uh, it may not you may not even have an answer to this based on what you just said. But uh, I learned that I was white when I was 19, right? right. <clears throat> and now I had a mirror in the house.
Lawrence Lawrence. Uh, I, knew, I knew the color of my skin, but yeah. I knew what it meant to be white when I was 19. Um, I first had to think about it when I was 19. And that's just because of the way I grew up, right? I, I grew up in similarly ratioed towns to what you were just talking about in schools, right? 90-10. I went yeah. to a university that was 90-10. I made probably 95-5, really, white to, white to uh, people of color. <clears throat> and so, uh, so I'm wondering... Uh, for you, when did you learn that you were black? Oh, I can tell you easy. Okay, so initially when I was growing up, basically the, the, the um, uh, I, I guess the world I lived in was pretty much an all black world, mm -hmm. right? So Inglewood, when we moved in, was basically making a transition. Um, it, Inglewood had been like the last restricted um, uh, community in LA. You know, it was hardcore white. When I mean hardcore, restrictive clauses, it was always known, it basically is the closest thing to a sundown town out here, right? Mm. And then um, uh, Blacks started moving in in the late 1960s. Whites started to move out. We moved in, I think, like 1972. I was like about five or six. And basically, the block turned, it was all Black, basically. And the Catholic school I went to was all Black. You know, except for the nuns, right? Except yeah. for nuns and the lay teachers, right? And the, the, the closest thing that I had to, like, anything like that was not Black were the Creole, you know, Antoines, the Duroncelettes, who, you know, who went to this Catholic school, right? That's the closest thing I had. So yeah. my world, all the way up until the sixth grade, was a Black world. A Black world. Until my mom got tired of driving us to the Catholic school over there. To She was like, look, I'm going to drive you to the Catholic school. It's right down the street. And so that was the very, 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 very first time that I'd been in a multicultural experience hmm. ever. And so suddenly I was in a, in a and, and this was to this day, the most multicultural school I had ever gone to in my life. It was Filipino, Japanese, Chinese, uh, 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 Latinx, black, white, all in equal ratios. Wow. It was the most. Yeah. And so it was. The first time I really, you know, I knew I was black. The, 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 the question for me is kind of like, when did somebody else want to remind you you were black? Mm. And I'll tell you, I know exactly that time and date. Um, sixth grade, new kid. Okay, cool. You got to kind of go through the gauntlet of, you know, being out in the schoolyard. Everybody's going to pick on you. Great. I got enough skills to, you know, come back. But I'm still kind of a skinny kid doing it. Yeah. So we have to go to mass. All right. So we're at lunch and this kid named Jim Taft. This is the most ir ironic thing in their life. Jim <laughs> Taft. Jim Taft. He goes right before the bell rings. He goes, get out of my way, nigga. And I go hard R, by the way, because uh, we didn't have the, the, the soft R. Hard R. <laughs> yeah, yeah, hard R. And then the bell rings. Jim Taft. And I'm like, I don't know how this goes out here. This ain't about to happen, right? But I'm still, you have to understand, all, everything I am, I'm the kid who gets outstandings for conduct. Yeah. You know, I'm the great. I, um, I'm the, you know, the person who, you know, is, uh, you know, the one, the, the, the nuns all love, you know. I'm the kid that they're going to send to Loyola and all the rest of the stuff. Great. Bell rings. So he thinks he's gotten away with it, right? Mass. So we have to go to mass, right? So we have to line up alphabetically. Perfectly fine. So the nun is at the beginning of the line and I'm R and he's T. So we're going and there you go. And we have to snake our way. We make a left and they have to make a right to get to the steps of the church and go inside the church for mass. Soon as they made that left, I stood out, got out of line and I cracked Jim Taft straight up in the eye. And I said, how you like this nigga now? And so he's down on the ground. The nuns come running. They can't believe that they're angelic, you know, you know, Lawrence has done this and they're like, oh my God, but here comes my mom. My mom is five feet tall and yet you know her presence when she walks in. She, <laughs> she walked through the double doors like in the movies. And I knew it was my mom. And, yeah. and, and Sister Jean, I think it was Sister Jean Therese, um, she walked through, she was like, what happened? And then she explained the whole stuff. She was like, he won't be suspended. He won't be detention. He's going right back into class. <laughs> and so the, the, the principal was like, I guess you're right, Mrs. Ross. And I went right back into class and there was nothing left to be said. <laughs> Fast forward, get on Facebook. Guess who uh, Jim Taft marries? A black woman. 
<laughs> well, there you go. I knocked some sets into him. He, you, you beat it into him. I beat it into him. So respect. <laughs> unfortunately, he passed away, you know, some years ago. But um, but but anyway, that was when I learned, you know, about you know who I was. I mean, in terms of how other people look, because yeah. I never thought it was. I never had any sense. I've never in my life had any sense that being black was a detriment, you know, or something to overcome. Or I have the healthiest, highest esteem when it comes to being black. I don't walk out in this world and think that this is something that I've got to hide or mm -hmm. mitigate or try to, you know, do, you know, whatever things, you know, it's not never been my, never been my stage. I don't even have to be, you know, I can be, I, my process has always been, I can be myself um, because I am absolutely comfortable in my skin. And, and, and I also kind of know, and this is the thing that I learned particularly at, um, at going to Loyola. Now, going to Loyola, everyone had said, Loyola is a, an academic meat grinder. It, was, it is to this day. Yeah. It's a very special type of kid, boy, that goes to Loyola, right? Yeah. Popped up, put in, and it's a meat grinder. They don't, they don't, they don't really stop it. They know their formula since 1865. They don't mm -hmm. stop it. But what I learned at Loyola was, oh, you know, this is a meat grinder, great. But these white kids, uh, these white boys, you know, and they're boys. So I'm not just saying this is like, but these white boys are not, you know, magic. They they don't have any magical academic <laughs> things that are over me. Yeah. And then it became, oh, we're going, and this was kind of a collective we, like all the black uh, boys there. We're gonna we're gonna crush them academically. We're gonna crush them in the classroom. We're gonna crush crush them with every argument. And that was our goal. And that's what we did. And we were the valley Victorian and whatever, the salutatory and, and, and all the like. And that was a very, that was something that I did. I noticed, for example, that some, you know, black students, particularly uh, from uh, some inner city um, uh, public schools who came to Berkeley, for example, mm -hmm. didn't have that same attitude. You know, we talk about imposter syndrome yeah, uh, yeah. a lot. Um, some and some really smart kids got overwhelmed. Um, by all of the kind of the things that people had told them they were not and what, you know, white, their white competitors were, you know, everything from yeah. they didn't deserve the seat or their scores weren't that high or, you know, or their grades weren't as high or so on and so forth, that they internalized that. And they always felt like they were in mud trying to, you know, climb the mountain. I didn't have that at all. Do you think one of the reasons why you didn't have that <clears throat> is because of the time of your life that you were exposed to it? Like I think about like my insecurities started younger. <clears throat> and so therefore, by the time I got to college, I was more, I was kind of like, I, I was, you know, I, I know my insecurities at that point. I, my self-esteem was having issues, but when I was younger, middle school-ish, high school, you know, early high school, uh, I was kind of still a little bit of brazen and bold and brash. Um, do you think there is some, something in there could be a little bit developmental or do you think it was just something special about that crew that you were with? Um, I, mean, I, think it's always, I think it's always a combination. I think it's yeah. a combination because, you know, it's like anything. I mean, we're in fraternities. Um, you know, we are kind of like the individual who come, comes into the fraternity, but you also like the, the, the composite parts. You, yeah. you, you get, you know, qualities from other people that you weren't exposed to, didn't know. Mm -hmm. And, you know, other people will make you brave in areas because they're braver in areas. Um, you'll, and on the counter side, you can lift other people up in areas that you're stronger in. Right. Yeah. Um, I think for me, it was really um, stressed um, for uh, when it came to um, uh, intellect to learn as much as you possibly can. Yeah. Th that's the number from every single person. So yeah. my aunts and uncles, like the generation before me, were the ones to go to college, right? Got it. Everyone else was a high school grad. Yeah. You know, if that. Right. So they all basically knew that the my intellect was the weapon that no one could take away from. Me. And you listen, you hear that when you're a kid and people are like, you know, education is power. And I, you know, I don't care about all that. Right. But <laughs> I was a kid, you know, he's like, OK, 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 grandma. You know, but I'm the person who soaked up all the encyclopedias like a lot of, you know, I'm not unusual with that. Right. But intellectual curiosity is the thing 
that allowed me to have bravery to take action. Mm -hmm. Because it, oftentimes I find that the people who are afraid to take action are almost always correlated to people who intellectually um, have not grown. Yeah. So isms, you know, sexism, right? Or misogyny or homophobia or things like that. They're typically people who at some point in time, their intellectual curiosity has stopped or stunted or they don't go into places to learn more. And so therefore it's more comfortable to stay in a place, right? Mm -hmm. And if you stay in a place, well then therefore you're not bold. You know, you can be bold wrong. Right. You know, I was like, you know, Dave Chappelle is bold wrong, right? <laughs> you know, you know. He just has a, you know, he just has a, you know, a, a gazillion dollars, a hype, you know, hyper ego and a whole bunch of people to cave for him. Right. But it is bold wrong. Right. Yeah. And he'll, that'll be over a period of history where we where we actually recognize that. But what you want to do is you want to be bold. Right. Right. You want to take chances because you are intellectually learning. You want to take chances because you experience because you just can't do it in an ivory tower. You have to actually go out there and experience it. Mm -hmm. And then you actually be from there. Think to yourself, what are the things that I learned from this that are new, that are not just from the book, not just from the experience, but what are the things that I learned that are new and then I can actually move forward? I can either express them or I can incorporate them into my life or I can influence other people. And that's how I that's how I tend to look at things. Yeah, I love that. <clears throat> yeah, I love that. I think it's. Uh... It's, uh, it, it's, it's interesting to hear you say, I don't know. I don't think I was taught learn everything you can. <clears throat> All right. That's a, that's a lesson that I, that I wasn't taught. And, right. uh, I think there's a reason you and I were taught different things, um, right. <laughs> <laughs> but I just, you know, I just want to name that. Right. Like, I mean, my, it's not that my parents were like, oh, don't learn anything. Right. So I wasn't taught right. the opposite. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's not. No, well, no parents, parents, but you know, you know, parents in general are more like, look, hey, no, but on, and by the way, let me put it this way. You know, that's all great for like how I am as an individual. Yeah. You know, my son's 23, wonderful son. You know, I turned into the parent by by, by high school that I used to talk about, right? Mm -hmm. I had done so much work in, you know, middle school, elementary school and volunteering and teaching and helping him through all the stuff. By the time he got to high school, I was like, man, what's the, what's power schools? Let me just check your grades. Are you good? Okay, good. I was <laughs> not doing any of that, right? So, <laughs> so his his journey is completely different than mine. You would yeah. think that, you know, being me or, you know, my wife kind of like in the exact same way that we would just be like inundating him with all this information about everything dealing with black people and all the rest of the stuff. Not really. Not really. You kind of have to find your own journey. You, ha you have to find your own journey. And then you also, as a you know parent, have to respect the journey of your child mm -hmm. uh, because we the, the, the kids always look like us and we have to kind of knock on wood to say, they're not us, you know, they're, 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 you know, and so, and you're going to, you're, you're going to see this uh, with, with your son, their, their personalities are going to be, and you kind of recognize this as a, as a parent six days in because yeah. they have needs that are specific to them mm -hmm. and how they express it is specific to them. And you're, that just continues on. And so it's kind of hard to be able to say like your journey is your journey. Mm -hmm. And in your journey is no less or or better, and my journey is no less you know, or better because of how it was. Um, it got us to this point right here on this day on this morning, um, and that's great. And that's what is that you know people out there should oftentimes think about that. A lot of times I see particularly young students, you know, they want to replicate because we teach students to have role models, right? Mm -hmm. And we say, we say, oh, you need, you need to have you know, a role model and everything. And then they go, I want to be just like you. And I'm like, well, why? <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, just like me. You want to be sloppy, you know, <laughs> you know like every day? Um, you know, I don't, okay. You know, but we should not replicate the people. We should be inspired by them, but understand that we have our own journey to take and trust in that journey. That's the biggest thing. Trust in that journey. Yeah. Yeah, that's beautifully put, man. <clears throat> that's really beautifully put. And here's what I love about your journey that that you shared uh, that <clears throat> we snuck past, but I want I want to come back to. And that's that you had mentioned when you went to, uh, to Berkeley and, and, and UCLA, um, <clears throat> how you know you were 
really passionate about uh, civil rights, uh, but really civil rights around blacks and black culture. Um, and that it was in that moment when you were, you know, 19, 20, 18, whatever, somewhere in that realm that you're like, oh, wait, what's going on with women? Oh, wait, what's going on with people who are differently abled? Oh, wait, what's going on with LGBT, right? Like, uh, I think uh, we frequently, uh, it, was a cool, it was a cool reminder, right? As someone who, at least in, in our market of, of college speakers, is uh, you are, I mean, you are the, the pinnacle of people who talk about uh, campus racism <clears throat> and, and campus culture. And it's really beautiful to also hear that like, yo, I didn't, it just all didn't click in. I wasn't all of a sudden like, boom, I'm here for everybody. No, was, no, no, no. Right? We needed a, that, that, that beautiful moment of learning. And like, and I'm sure in each one of those instances, you had to step in the shit uh, and then, and then, you know, and then figure it's, it out. The, the thing that I, I, I mean, you know, talking about, you know, lecture, right. Um, what I do not love, I do not like, and I, I, I abhor, honestly, I will say, are people who go up on stage and lecture about things just because they think they can lecture about it. Mm -hmm. Meaning that it's not that they're passionate about it or they you know, have an expressed interest where they actually done a deep dive into it. It's just a great topic. So they decide they're going to lecture. about it. You know, the, the reason why it came to me um, for uh, campus racism is one of the things I've been trained to do um, throughout my whole life or, you know, working the place you know, working in different places is to observe, recognize patterns. You know, you talk about my consumer trends. I was, uh, worked for a company called Iconoculture during grad school. Mm -hmm. And, um, I loved it. It was the best job I ever had because, well, one, they paid for grad school, but the other way is that, um, it taught me to observe the, the zeitgeist. It's a fancy word for what's going on in society. Right. And, um, when I was lecturing in divine nine lectures, uh, students of color would come to me after my lectures, like universally asking about um, what was, you know, what was, you know, the, the, you know, talking about their experience. So initially I, I was thinking, well, maybe I'll just center it on the issues of um, the, uh, you know, like, you know, IFC, Pan, you know, Pan Hill. And my, but what, what, what really happened is actually my editor to, to tell you honestly at St. Martin's Press, um, she said, no, you know, expand it out. And so you have to be curious and you start digging. And I love, you know, my degree is in history. So I love archives. So I'm, you know, you, you tell me that I can spend like, you know, you're going to pay me to spend months in an archive, a dark archive. I'm going to be hyped and happy. <laughs> All right? so, so I was like, woo, guess what I'm going to find? Because everything is a treasure. So, oh, it was just amazing to find. But you, even all that is still about finding the ingredients. Mm. It's about finding the ingredients for, you know, the actual meal, meaning uh -huh. that I can have all that information and I could be, you know, you know, uh, you know, know everything about, you know, racism on college campuses. But how do you synthesize it in a way, in a manner that actually has a visceral feeling to the people who are actually going to be listening to you? Right. Uh, who are going to be talking to you. And that's that's what I had to basically try to do when I did my, my black ball, you know, campus racism lectures and stuff. You know, how do you, you know, construct that? How do you construct that story? How do you tell that story? That's what Yeah. I mean. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. And 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 uh that brings me actually to an, an interesting point that I wanted to ask you about is that, you know, you have chosen uh to in in my eyes go into the belly of the beast. And talk about this topic, right? You say, you know, IFC and Panhellenic. So IFC, the Interfraternal uh, Council, mm -hmm. um, Pan uh, National Panhellenic Council as well. Basically the historically white, though they don't like to call themselves that, the historically white fraternities and sororities <clears throat> that have been around since the mid-1800s um, and, uh, and that are still wildly white today as well. <clears throat> um, mm -hmm. And uh, these are also a fascinating group of people because not only can these people afford college, yeah. um, they can afford to join a private organization at their college. Right. Um, and so they're very privileged. And mm -hmm. then we make them feel even more special by telling yeah. them they're a part of an elite group, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah. so, uh, and now obviously you and I are both Greeks so we're not knocking the Greek system. We're just naming right. what it is. Right. Um, and so, uh, but you've chosen to make this your career. And I know you talk to other audiences as well, but, uh, but to go in and talk to these 
Uh, again, predominantly, uh, largely 95% white audiences mm -hmm. um, and have these conversations. Yeah. Um, you know, that's... Uh, you know, in some ways in, in time, you're, you're, you're attacking the, the snake head on. Yeah. Um, and, and I'm curious to hear about the decision to do that. Now you have never been anyone, uh, uh, someone to shy away from an intellectual discourse. You've, right. uh, you've, uh, with the exception of poor, uh, Mr. Taft, you haven't really popped a lot of people in the eye, uh, cause you're too busy knocking them down with your wit and intelligence. <laughs> um, and, uh, so, uh, but, uh, um, and so you never want to shy away from a conversation. And I'd love, I'd love to hear your thoughts on, you know what, this is where I want to go in, right? As oh. a speaker, we got to pick where we go in and you're like, you know what, I'm going, I'm going right for it. Tell me. Oh, it's that. easy. I, and that's a great question. Um, I, I can tell you, uh, it was, uh, you know, so the book is, the book came out in 2016, January, 2016. And so now I'm still trying to figure out how I'm going to craft, craft my lecture. So the one thing I do know is um, I'm trying to, you, what you want to do is you want to be able to psychologically get to people so they listen and hear what you're trying to say, right? One of the things I had noted, and I'd always found very, very curious, is that when white members of the white fraternities and sororities would talk about race, they would always do it the exact same way. We were bad in the past. We're good now. Live your values. And please, let's not talk about this anymore because I don't want any <laughs> notes from any of your alums or parents about talking yeah. about race. It was a real kumbaya, you know, moment, right? Yeah. So I, I, I remember I was in a uh, we have a we have a group that you know well. It's a Facebook group called NASPA Fraternity and Sorority uh, Group, and I remember it was like about November, and so I'm still trying to work on my my lecture, figure out how to you know go about the right tone, and someone says. Oh, yeah, we were we've been talking about race forever, you know, for, for, you know, a lot. And so I actually saw the deck of what they were actually doing. And I was like, oh, hell no. It was the most gentle kind of, you know, yeah. it, it underestimates particularly white members. It underestimated white members and it treated white members, particularly the 18, 20 year old members on campus, like they were precious that they could not take the, the, the uh, and under, understand concepts like racism. Like they just couldn't. So we don't want to offend them or, you know, we don't want to shut them out, shut them down. And people would always ask me, well, how do you do your, your lecture without them, um, you know, focusing out of the, the lecture? And I'm like, that's not my problem. That's literally not my problem. If you're making a psychological or moral um, decision to shut yourself down from listening to something that is, I'm not telling you, I'm not making this stuff up, then that's your thing to deal with. But you're there, so you have to hear it, and you're going to start to see all the stuff. So my, I, once I saw that, um, I knew that my lecture was going to be relatively hardcore. Mm -hmm. And it has. It is from the first second that I start the lecture. It is hardcore, <laughs> and it is designed to um, to get your attention. It's not designed mm -hmm. to be provocative for provocative sake. It's designed to get your attention because I'm I'm not here for a kumbaya moment. I'm here to talk about the issue and the realities and the underlying fun, you know foundational. So doing all that. Every time, you know, my exit interview um, surveys from the students are always, you know, 98 percent fantastic. Right. And there's always the number one, the number one comment from the students is no one ever talked to us like this. Yeah. No one ever talked to us like this. And the next thing there is a call to action. So they begin to say, how can we actually go out and do something? Because if you don't know what the problem is, if you don't know where you are within the problem, how the hell do you think the problem is important? Yep. And, you know, and so from that point, for the last six years, at least for this, um, uh, and I, and this is the thing, I completely encourage organizations, you know, to bring me to talk to their members. I, I joke that the, the, the first uh, uh, white sorority to bring me was Kappa Kappa Gamma. Mm -hmm. um, they brought me, geez, I think by 2018. And uh, Beth Black was the president of Kappa Kappa Gamma. Awesome woman. Awesome, awesome woman. And um, she, she brings me on stage and I do my lecture and I end. There's about a thousand white women in there. I said, look at you all. 
thousand white women and number, none of you so, uh, spontaneously combusted due to uh, listening to a, a, a lecture on white supremacy. And they all laughed. It was mm -hmm. okay. And they're yeah. learning that it's okay to actually tackle it on uh, heads up. Now, some of them are doing it. Others are very, very comfortable being where they actually are. Sure. Like very, very comfortable being where they actually are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> I'll keep plowing away. Oh, I know you will. Um, and it's, yeah, it's incredible. I've, I've had the privilege of seeing, uh, I've seen, I've gotten to see Black Bolt twice now. Um, and you're right. From the jump, you're coming for him. Um, and you're yeah. not, you're not pulling any punches. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's very yeah. powerful. Because why are black and brown and, and Asian students having to take the brunt? You know, a lot of times what happens is that, you know, black, brown, Asian students are the ones who have to sit in the audience, listen to someone talk about campus racism don't really address the issue and they leave the uh, they leave the the auditorium feeling frustrated because no one really talked directly about the issue that they're affected with that uh, that really does have a, a quantitative effect on them when it comes to graduating or when it comes to their you know, their 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 health or uh whether or not you know they they're you know the qualitative about how they view their school all those things we just put it on them and like oh y'all can tolerate it yeah. And no one else puts as you know, responsibility is on uh, you students over here. The white students are clustered around uh, the IFC Panhellenic and beyond. Mm -hmm. I do that. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, and I think it's also, it is uh, for wildly unfair that we would expect uh, black and brown students to be the teachers of their own experience while they're still experiencing it and learning it and trying to figure out their own, how, what the hell do I, how the hell do I feel about this? Yeah. Um, and uh, it's, yeah. And it's wildly unfair that, uh, that, that they're continuously put into that position. Um, I, so. I remember a young woman, a, um, a South Asian woman from Ohio state. And she said, you know, I came here to be an engineer, you know, not to have to deal with, you know, you know, racism and all the rest of the stuff, but I'll deal with it. But I came here to be an engineer. Yeah. You know, and, but you put this on top of me, but I will protest for my own humanity. basically. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> the work that you do on college campuses is really powerful, Lawrence. Uh, I'm wondering what does it look like off college campuses today? What are, what are some ways that you are uh, amplifying either that message or, or similar, uh, similar messages, or maybe something completely different just around celebrating black culture? You know, what, uh, you know, you have the metaphor club in, in Los Angeles, of course, mm -hmm. and, you know, what, what are, what are some, what are some things that you're working on? So it's almost always integrated in almost everything that you do. Um, and this is for, you know, everyone who's out there who's, uh, you know, going or particularly if you're young, you're doing you're, you, you, you need to have a root philosophy mm -hmm. of what you're why you're on this planet. It can't just be the grind. It just can't just be I want to get this, this, this and grind. That, that, that's a gears in the, in the machine. What is the machine? And why does the machine exist is mm -hmm. what you really want to ask yourself. And so, you know, so for me, everything is kind of always a part of one of those things. So I'm one of the partners uh, along with three of my frat brothers of um, the metaphor club. We started this four years ago and it was inspired. And I always put it, put it uh, so I give him credit by, by uh, Mark Lamont Hill, a member of Kappa Alpha Psi. I'll give him that. He inspired me on this. I did a, a book signing at his uh, cafe called Uncle Bobby's Cafe in Philly and uh, loved the whole vibe of everything. Got back here and was like, we should have something like that here. And, um, you know, this place, you know, had been uh, empty, damn near abandoned for three to four years. Um, and we gutted it from, you know, gutted it to basically almost to the studs to recreate kind of a, a space, a third space between work and home. Yeah. That was community, uh, a, um, a space where it's black centered, you know, everything we do from like if we're watching, you know, political debates, you know, we we do it with like a black perspective of, you know, we you know, we encourage people to talk back at the TV, you know, mm -hmm. that type of deal. Right. Because, you know, you can't tell black people not to talk back at the TV, <laughs> um, you know. But, you know, what, what's funny is that, you know, our slogan is black owned, all welcome. And uh, and and our mutual friend of ours, uh, Dan Fail, is like uh, is a white guy who is in Greek life, too. And he's like one of our first members. And I just remember that uh, we were having um, the South Carolina debate uh, party. Right. So the whole place is packed. 
Dan is the only white guy here. And Dan is from North Carolina. He's explaining to like these elderly sisters who like all grandmothers, one who's literally knitting about why <laughs> South Carolina is terrible and they don't have any major cities because that's how terrible it is. And they all go, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so they all doing this. And he sent me an email. He said, do you understand how great it was to be in a space where I, my voice wasn't the reason or the main amplified voice? It was just one voice out of many. And he said it was just fun. So that's how, you know, basically this place actually is. Um, and then I have all my various projects. You know, I have my normal book projects. Um, I am the person who has a gazillion things going on at the same time. I have book projects. I've got film and television projects. And I'm about to, the one project I'm about to launch, it's kind of was in beta. It was just kind of tested out over the last year. But I'm really about to launch it in the fall is uh, my um, online marketplace for marginalized Business is owned by marginalized groups. Um, it's called 365 Ally. If you go there now, yeah. you'll see something, but it's not what it's going to be. Um, basically, the idea is to um, encourage organizations to intentionally shop at Black, Latinx, AAPI, Indigenous, women-owned, disabled, and LGBTQ businesses. And for um, curating businesses, by the way, I'm looking for these businesses, specifically retail package businesses, you know, I sell cookies, doggy treats or something like that. Yeah. The retail package uh, type businesses. And the whole idea came again from w- the continued work on campuses. Organizations were, you know, with their DEI, diversity, equity and inclusion um, efforts were like, well, how can we support like black businesses and things like that? And I'm like, oh, here's a list. And, you know, OK, it's a list. But it really wasn't something that they could tell their members to go this week and go support. Yeah. And so I decided I, I create it. Anything is possible. It's mm-hmm. not, you know, rocket science. Find the people who know how to do it, pay them, and then they create it. Yeah. You know, so, you know, I'm not trying to be Amazon, but what I am trying to do is expose businesses that normally would not be exposed to organizations or, you know, fraternities and sororities that have thousands, tens of thousands of members and get them to support those businesses because those people are going to be supported. They're going it, to, it helps their livelihood, helps pay for their kids helps pay, you know, bring taxes, all those things. And uh, again, the way I look at stuff is almost always the exact same way. What's the foundation? What's the twist? That's the wow. And that's the thing. Okay. Marketplace, foundation, twist. It's for for marginalized groups. That's the wow. Boom. Intentional uh, spending by, you know, Kappa Kappa Gamma, Delta Gamma, all Mm -hmm. the like on these businesses. Yeah, that's beautiful. <clears throat> that's incredible. Uh, I got a few businesses I'll tell you about also that I've been that I've been appreciating. I don't know if they're a part of your network yet, but um, <clears throat> but yeah. But uh, so uh, I got one last question for you, and it's it's a huge question. It's kind of a ridiculous last question. It may not even be our last question, but I think it will be. Um, but we're in a, we're in a fascinating time right now in right. the world. Uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, Texas is out here trying to pass laws about, uh, slavery now not being called slavery and being called involuntary relocation right. um, and things like that, which was not passed fortunately, but you know, we'll see. They'll, they'll run it. They'll try it again. Sure. Texas enough. is a gift that gives, keeps giving for my lecture. Te- uh, te- yeah, I'm sure between Texas and Florida, you're never going to run out of places. No, no. Um, <clears throat> and so, uh, we're at a fascinating, time right now where there are some states where I don't even know if you would be allowed to go in and speak. Um, unless yeah. it was at a private institution, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, like I don't think you could go speak at a public institution in Florida right now, technically, or they would mm-hmm. they would get in trouble and then who knows, right? Right. Yeah. Um and uh you I know, was actually were- told that by the way. I was actually told that by a um I'm not gonna say who it was, but yeah. I was told that by um a, a fraternity and sorority life official. Mm-hmm. That if I they brought me, then they would get fired. Yeah, yeah, yep. Exactly. I mean, Tina's putting on uh, her. She has a uh, conference called Persist, a badass women's conference, and she's going to do it at Florida State in October. <clears throat> and uh, she normally always has somebody uh, come in, and one of the speakers that she brings in, and as part of the whole crew, um, it always talks about language and talks about uh, <clears throat> uh, you know diversity and, and everything right equity inclusion and uh and they were like we may need to talk about that person um and right and so it's a fascinatingly disappointing time um <clears throat> and i'm wondering for someone who is uh who, a this is a, a biggest part of your livelihood but even even more than your livelihood it is just your life 
Now, right. Right, as you talk about the times when you were super young, where you're like, nah, bro, I showed up, I showed up ready, ready. Um, right? I, ready. And I showed up ready and I've just been building an arsenal of more and more intellect and experience to be able to come at you with everything I got. Right. Um, <clears throat> and so, uh, uh, how are you feeling about this moment right now with where we are? Oh, it's, it's, it's one of those things where you, you have to always recognize, first of all, I'm an eternal optimist. But the first thing you have to recognize is that these are um, specious, um, you know, people, you know, and, you know, who are, you know, using tin pot, for, you know, tin pot racist and fascist type of, of mechanisms to, you know, get short term you know, political game. But, you know, if you understand history, you always know that they end up hanging upside down in a gas station. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's what it is. That's what you always recognize is that they're not going to win over the long period of time. Um, I'm less worried about, you know, whether or not I speak at a particular place or anything else like that. But also, if I do speak at a place, I speak there unafraid. I, I always talk about the fact that when, when you teach people, we're just talking about the bravery part, right? Um, when you teach people how to, for, say, for example, to protest, there's there are various ways, right, where people feel comfortable, right? And each place you go, you feel a little bit more and more comfortable. Most people feel comfortable in ways that do not affect them directly, where they can express themselves, but it cannot harm them, right, at, uh, directly. So I'll make a Facebook post, I'll change my avatar, you know, I'll put a pithy thing, whatever. Next group are the people who go out on the sidewalk, right? Still within the confines of what you know, people say you should do within the rules of society. And then they're the ones who take the first step out on the street. They break the law by going out into a place that is unfamiliar. Mm -hmm. You have to get used to being putting your feet out on the street and being unfamiliar um, to where you feel comfortable being in those places. So if you are, then you will never sit back and get afraid at, say, for example, speaking in a state like Florida and speaking the exact same thing that you spoke at any other place. Because if you're speaking the truth, then you can fight whoever wants to actually fight you about speaking the truth because you're going to win. Um, even if you lose, you're still going to win. Maybe history is going to teach you or whatever is going to hit. You're going to win. And it is important for all of us to not be cowed you know, cowered by um, people who are literally trying to make you not speak, who are literally trying to tell you that I want to suppress it so much that you will not be able to speak. You have to look them and demand. You have to push back against it. You have to push back against it because the only thing they're going to do is continue to eat um, off the weakness or the, the, the fear that is a natural human fear. But you have to be brave enough to not be able to be cow uh, cowered by it. And if you're brave enough to not be cowered by it, you will win in the end. They are always in the dustbins of uh, dust, the, the trash bin of history. Um, and, and they know it in a certain way um, because you wouldn't want to, uh, you know, you have the headwinds behind you. But the but the whirlwind is what actually gets you. And the whirlwind for Florida and the whirlwind for Texas, it'll come. It's the same way as segregationists, you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, segregations were had the, the had the foundation, the power, everything behind them, and underneath their feet. And then the whirlwind came, and they they were in the dustbin of history. We don't even talk about them. We take down their statues. Uh, they are no longer. They still they are st still taught, talked about with derision um, by people to this day. So that's what I look at. They don't they don't win. My my, my folks have been here since 1750 something. Mm -hmm. I don't give a damn about some some cat, you know, who's sitting up here telling, you know, saying don't talk about race and racism. Ah. What's he going to do? Have a press conference with his cheerleading squad behind him? <laughs> <laughs> I, should, I, I, yeah. I should actually go see if I can, if I really want to do that, I should go like to Ben and Jerry's and see if they'd sponsor a tour of uh, of some, uh, some uh, public schools in, in Florida. That would be excellent. There you go. And you know, ben, ben and Jerry's would be down too. Yeah. Anybody wants to sponsor uh, me uh, going to Florida, Florida State, let me know. Let's go. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'll be right there. Both Ben and Jerry, longtime listeners of this podcast. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Exactly. Hey, man, I eat enough of their, ch their chocolate fudge ice cream, so I, they should be. That's it. I'm here for that peanut butter fudge core. Um, yeah. <laughs> all right. Let's both work on Ben and Jerry sponsors. Um, exactly. 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 Lawrence, it is 
incredible spending this time with you, brother. I appreciate uh, the time that you that you hung out with me here in the diner. Uh, every time I hang out with you, I I, I learn more, um, and uh, I would say m- almost more importantly, I become more brave. Uh, I'm someone who uh, I, I'm not proud of this, but I am I am who I am, and I'm working on. I'm someone who I need people to like me, um, yeah. and so uh, <clears throat> and so to to. To watch you on stage, do what you do, to hear you in conversations, it reminds me that like you can't, you cannot be afraid. You got to step in the muck. You get it's okay. And I mean, I teach discomfort, and I don't mind discomfort. Uh, but it's always, it's always a learning process. Right. Um, and uh, you know, I just had a speech in Florida last week, and I, I did talk about social justice. We did it in a slightly different way because right. um, I, you know, I didn't want to piss off the person who brought me. But you know, we still gonna squeeze it in here. Yeah. Um, and uh, and also, I also recognize that it's probably different from when it's coming out of my face and when it's coming out of your face as yeah, disappointing yeah. as that is um no, but, and uh, you know, but, but sometimes you know um you know <clears throat> you know you know i adore both of y'all but you know I, one of my pr- proudest moments is uh is your wife tina um i had a couple of years back i think it was when in with afa was in um was in anaheim Mm-hmm. And, uh, and it always is hard for alphas to go because it's always during Alpha Founders Day. Yeah. And so that day I went to I, I missed the um, the uh, sorority town hall meeting, but I was there for the um, the white predominantly white um, fraternity town hall meeting. So I get there and I say, um, wow. And I'm like, damn, I'm mad that. Um, I didn't go to the sorority town hall meeting because I was going to ask them what they're doing, you know, to like uh, deconstruct white supremacy within uh, the white sororities. And somebody said, oh, don't worry about it. Tina asked that question at the town hall meeting. That's what it means. That's what I'm talking about. And I was like, that's my girl. She She asked the question. That's the same thing. So it doesn't Mm -hmm. matter in terms of, you know, how, you know, people hear it or who they hear it from. You know, yeah. a lot of times is they hear it and they'll hear it from which other places, a receptor that makes them, you know, open their ears up more. Men mm-hmm. will hear a thing from men more often. Yes, it is. a You know, we shouldn't. But sometimes men have to be in men's spaces to talk about uh, women's issues, uh, so-called women's issues that are really mm-hmm. our issues, too. Um, but we should talk about those things, misogyny, sexism and things like that. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, straight people have to talk about LGBTQ things. Right. And all those things, you know, can be from different voices. We just have to recognize when we should not dominate that voice. Uh, you know, when we're talking, you know, you know, because no one's more uh, eager than evangelicals. <laughs> and so <laughs> you know, I know something and it's like, slow down. Slow Let down. the person who's actually experiencing this <laughs> tell their story. Right. Yeah. So that's what we always have to remind ourselves as we go about this work. Yeah, yeah. Lawrence, I appreciate you, man. Tell the people where they can find you and uh, where, where you'd like to link up with them. I'm the world's easiest alpha to find. Uh, all of my Twitter, uh, Instagram, and uh, you know, handles are alpha1906. Um, you can find me in terms of my website. It's the, and I'm not trying to be pretentious. Somebody else just beat me to my name. Uh, <laughs> the, T-H-E, Lawrence, L-A-W-R-E-N-C-E, Ross, R-O-S-S, dot com. Uh, and I'm starting to book, I don't know if it's on, on the thing, but I'm starting to book my colleges. So let me know if you're interested. Mm-hmm. And my, my email address is alpha1906 at gmail.com. I appreciate you, brother. Appreciate so fun you. hanging out with you. This has been a beautifully ice cold conversation. There you go, baby. There you go. <laughs> get a, you got a you got a you got a uh, ice cold brother here, and you got a centaur on the other side. What could go wrong? <laughs> <laughs> uh, what could go wrong, indeed? Thank you so much for coming, man. I really appreciate you, dude. Thank you, man. I appreciate you too. Hell yeah. Y'all, that was my time with Lawrence Ross, incredible lecturer, author. Uh, he talks about, uh, I cannot recommend his, 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 his book, Blackballed, enough. Um, even if you're not on a college campus, it doesn't matter. College, uh, college history is our country's history. Um, and the conversation extends past those four or five years if people go to college anyway. Um, but uh, I love his reminder uh, to always learn more, but to also uh, to speak up more as well and be bold. 
uh, with what you say in the spaces where it may make you feel the most uncomfortable. Uh, don't just speak up in the places where you think someone's going to pat you on the back and be like, hey, man, thanks so much for saying that. Sometimes we got to speak up in those places where people are going to be like, man, really wish you hadn't said that, but now you made us think. And y'all, I appreciate that. And I appreciate Lawrence and I appreciate you. Till next time, do me a favor. Keep punching small talk in the face by asking better questions. You all take care.